Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning dear students welcome to my class this is lecture number 12 in this lecture we will be discussing how lord wellesley expanded the british territories in india through the policy of subsidiary alliance after lord convalis sir john shore became the governor general of india after the expiry of the period of Sir John Shore as the Governor General of India, Lord Wellesley became the next Governor General in 1798. He remained the post of Governor General from 1798 to 1805 for a duration of seven years. Before his appointment, to the post of Governor General, he had served as the Lord of the British Treasury as well as the Commissioner of the Board of Control. You may recall that the Board of Control, which was the representative of the British government, which controlled the affairs of the English East India Company. What was his mission in India? His mission in India in a nutshell, was it to make the English East India Company the supreme authority in India? To amalgamate the territories of the Indian states to the British Empire, to reduce all the Indian states to the dependent of the British. With these missions in mind, Lord Wellesley landed in India in 1798 as the Governor General. You recall that one of the provisions of the Fitz India Act passed by the British Parliament in 1784, Fitz India Act. Under this Act, the English East India Company in India was to maintain peace with the Indian states and the English East India Company should not engage in aggressive wars in India. This was a provision mentioned in the Pitts India Act passed by the British Parliament in 1784. But the mission of Lord Wellesley was totally against this. He was not ready to give up the policy of non-intervention in the affairs of the Indian states. He believed that the non-interference with the affairs of the Indian states would only strengthen the Indian states against the British administration in India. So, he adopted the policy of aggressive wars against the Indian states. Even though the Pitts India Act forbade aggressive wars in India, the war ministry in Britain sided with the mission pursued by Lord Wellesley. He was offensive against the Indian states, adopted many offensive measures against the Indian rulers. He himself called as the Bengal Tiger. And in order to subdue and to bring the Indian states under the dependence of the English East India Company, Lord Wellesley effectively devised the subsidiary alliance and began to be extensively used in Indian states. This was the policy devised by Lord Wellesley 
to make the Indian states dependent upon the English East India Company. In addition to make the Indian states dependent upon the English East India Company, he wanted to establish British supremacy in India. Lord Wellesley came in the backdrop of Napoleonic menace in Europe. It forced him to further strengthen the English East India Company in India against the possible Napoleonic attack. The subsidiary alliance system effectively introduced by Lord Wellesley played a key role in bringing Indian states under the dependency of the English East India Company. No doubt through the application of the policy of subsidiary alliance, he brought into the British Empire a number of Indian states. Now coming to the history of the policy of subsidiary alliance, it was not devised initially by Lord Wellesley. Even before the period of Lord Wellesley, the system of subsidiary alliance had been in existence in India. Robert Clive was the first person belonging to English East India Company who had devised and introduced this system of subsidiary alliance. Even before that, Duple effectively introduced this system in India. Robert Clive, as you may recall that the Treaty of Allahabad, which was signed between Shuja Udawla, the Nawab of Auth and the Robert Clive in 1765. Under this Treaty of Allahabad, the Nawab of Auth, Shuja Udawla had to cede the territories of Allahabad and Korea to Shah Alam II and it was also required to pay a war indemnity of 50 lakh rupees. Following which subsidiary alliance was concluded between Robert Clive and the Nawab of Auth. Under this treaty, the English East India Company took over the defense of the frontiers of the Auth to make Auth as one of the buffer state. Auth was the buffer state of the English East India Company and it had been acting as the buffer state since 1765. And the British army was stationed at Auth for which the Nawab of Auth was required to meet the expenses of the maintenance of the British troops. But Robert Clive introduced this system of subsidiary alliance only in Auth. But this was not the case with regard to Wellesley. He was an imperialist par excellence. This divisive subsidiary alliance system began to be extensively used on most of the Indian states. And before the arrival of Lord Wellesley as the Governor General, there were some states which had experienced the system of subsidiary alliance. As you have been told earlier, it was during the period of Robert Clive, the subsidiary alliance system was introduced in Auth, following which a British resident was also stationed at the capital of the Nawab of Auth, Lucknow. After the conclusion of the treaty for the imposition of subsidiary alliance on Auth, 
in 1787 Dr. Cornwallis he introduced the system of subsidiary alliance in Carnatic and it was for the first time in 1787 that the subsidiary state should not have any foreign relations. All the foreign relations of the subsidiary state would have it to surrender for the care of the English East India Company. The subsidiary state would not have any independent relations. And on 21st January 1798, the Nawab of Auth was signed another treaty with his then Governor General John Shore. And it was the renewal treaty since subsidiary alliance had already been in existence in Auth since the days of Robert Clive in 1765. But on the part of the renewal of the subsidiary alliance between the Nawab of Auth and the British, a treaty was ended between Sir John Shore and the Nawab of Auth. Under this treaty, the Nawab of Auth would, would not hold communications with the with any other European powers, nor did employ other European powers without the consultation of the British. And later certain changes were introduced in the subsidiary alliance system. Initially for the services of the English East India Company, payments were, payments were made. But later, instead of payment of money, territories in full sovereignty began to be surrendered to the British instead of cash payment. These were the initial attempts made by the English East India Company towards the introduction of the subsidiary alliance in Indian states. But Lord Wellesley elaborated and began to extensively use the subsidiary alliance for increasing the dominions of the English East India Company. What were the conditions of the subsidiary alliance devised and elaborated by Lord Wellesley? One. The Indian state was required to surrender its foreign relations to the care of the English East India Company. It would not have to engage with any third power. All its relations with the third power should be through the British. The Indian states were not entered into war with other powers. This was the second condition of the subsidiary alliance policy devised by Lord Wellesley. The main negotiator, the English East India Company, only through which the Indian states could negotiate. English East India Company emerged as the main arbiter. A large state was required to surrender its territories in full sovereignty to the English East India Company for the maintenance of British troops at their capitals. The Indian ruler also had to surrender these territories in full sovereignty. It means that if a territory was surrendered to the British, the Indian ruler would not have any further say on the territories which had been handed over to the British. In these places, the revenue collection, administration, all these would be vested with the hands of the British. 
the indian ruler would not in any way to interfere with the administration of the these ceded territories these came into known as ceded territories ceded territories most of the time large indian states instead of cash payment ceded the ceded territories to the care of the english east india company but as far as small state was concerned since it not to have sufficient territory to surrender they paid the tribute in cash to the english east india company while the larger state ceded territories and in addition to the surrendering of the territories or the cash payment respectively for the larger and small indian states both the small as well as the large indian states were required to accept a british resident who resided at the capital of the indian states for example the british resident at auth resided at lucknow the capital of the auth then the indian states were not in a position to employ other europeans in its service without the consultation of the english east india company then it was told that the english east india company company's resident stationed at the capital would in no way interfere the day to day administration of the indian states this was the promise made by the english east india company the company would protect the indian state against the foreign invasions now coming to the major advantages what were the advantages of the english east india company through devising and effectively extending this policy of subsidiary alliance on indian states one of the main advantage was that through the policy of subsidiary alliance the british was able to disarm indian states indian states were no longer required to maintain a huge standing army the protection would be taken over by the british who maintained a large force at these indian rulers capitals so there was no need for the indian states to maintain a huge standing army now these indian states were under the protection of the english east india company it enabled the company to maintain a large standing army at the cost of the indian states because the maintenance of these large troops the cost of the maintenance of these large troops were met by the indian states not from the coffers of the english east india company english east india company did not loss even a single rupee for the maintenance of this large standing army all the expenses for the maintenance of this large standing army came from indian states as you know these troops company's troops were maintained at the capitals of the indian rulers so the these troops could effectively and strategically control key positions in india one of the major advantages of the subsidiary alliance system introduced by the british was that the company was no longer to involve in long term wars with the indian states engaging long term wars with the indian states let the company financially bankrupt its resources 
what it have been mobilized for financing the war operations against the Indian states by adopting this policy of subsidiary alliance the English East India Company was not required to find finance for its military operations its armies expenses were met by Indian rulers and because of the huge standing army this English East India Company was able to check any French attack in the backdrop of Napoleonic danger from Europe and it also helped the Britishers in other ways as well. One of the provisions of the subsidiary alliance was not to employ the Frenchmen. So, these Indian states dismissed the Frenchmen from their service ending the fear of the French in occupying the British territories. Nizam, Hyderabad's Nizam was forced to dismiss the Frenchmen employed by him. After the dismissal of this Frenchmen, these French soldiers were sent to the prison in Calcutta. And the English East India Company emerged as the main arbiter in the interstate disputes. One of the main advantages of the subsidiary alliance system introduced by Wellesley was that Indian capitals built at considerable influence in the affairs of the Indian state by British residents. Even though it was promised that the British resident would not interfere with the affairs of the day-to-day -day administration of the Indian rulers, but in practice the British residents stationed in Indian capitals intervened in the day-to-day -day administration of these Indian states. It was actually a breach of trust against the a treaty signed between the subsidiary state and the British. What were the disadvantages of the Indian states? One of the main disadvantages of this subsidiary alliance system was that the Indian states were required to surrender their foreign relations to the company. From the imposition of the subsidiary alliance, these Indian states would not have any free or independent foreign policy. Their foreign policy would be controlled by the English East India Company. As you have been told earlier, even though the British promised that the British residents stationed at the state capital would not interfere with the affairs of the Indian rulers or the day-to-day -day administration of the Indian rulers, but in practice this did not happen. The British resident interfered with the Indian affairs of the states and wielded considerable influence in the formulation of the policies of these Indian states. Now provision against the misrule. In case of a misrule by a rebellion led by the masses or through foreign attack, it was possible to change the ruler. But now there was no provision in case of a misrule by an Indian ruler earlier through revolutions or through the foreign attack, the misrule came to an end. Because of the heavy expenses incurred on the maintenance of the British troops, the Indian states became financially bankrupt. As you know, the annual subsidy to be given 
for the maintenance of the British troops in Indian states was one third of the annual revenue of the state. It was a huge amount. The soldiers of the English East India Company were given high amount of salary and they used it to let luxurious life. So, all these expenses were met from the coffers of the Indian states. So, it resulted financial bankruptcy of the Indian states. Because of the heavy demands of the English East India Company, the Indian rulers were forced to impose further tax on the people. What would be the negative result? Impoverishment of the country. More taxes began to be collected from the people to meet the expenses of the huge standing army maintained at the capitals of the Indian rulers by the English East India Company. It was a heavy burden on the ruler as well as the people of the state. Some states, instead of the cash payment, used it to surrender their territories. Instead of the subsidy in cash payment. But during the surrender of these territories, instead of the cash payment, the amount was fixed high. For example, in Hyderabad, when the Nizam was not in a position to make the subsidy in cash payment, he decided to surrender territories for 40 lakh rupees subsidy. But for 40 lakh rupees subsidy, the Nizam of Hyderabad surrendered territory yielding 62 lakh rupees per annum, which was another form of exploitation made by the English East India Company. Once this territory was surrendered, the Indian ruler lost sovereignty on these territories. They were no longer able to collect tax or maintain land order. All these territories went under the control of the English East India Company. Now coming into subsidiary alliance in operation by Lord Wellesley. In this session, we are going to see which Indian states Lord Wellesley brought under the control of the British through the application of the policy of subsidiary alliance. Wellesley, he came to India in 1798. In the same year, he made the first subsidiary treaty with the Naisam of Hyderabad. It was at the cost of 2,41,710 British pounds per annum. Nizam agreed to pay this amount for the maintenance of the British troops at his state capital. And following which he also surrendered a dismissage. The French soldiers he had maintained in his dominion. These French soldiers were sent to the prisons of Calcutta. Nizam of Hyderabad maintained six battalions of subsidiary force at Hyderabad. Why did Nizam maintain this huge standing army of supplied by the British, it was against the possible Maratha attack. The British, by imposing subsidiary alliance, promised it to protect his state from the Maratha invasion. After two years, 
in 1800 the subsidiary force was increased earlier it was 6 battalion but later the number of battalions was increased by the Nizam of Hyderabad and in order to meet the expenses in the form of cash payment or subsidy he used to cede territories to major important districts of the Hyderabad, Bellari and Kadappa. These two districts were surrounded by Nizam of Hyderabad. From these ceded territories, the British collected land revenue as well as maintenance law and order. In addition to that, he was also required to surrender territories south of the Tungabhadra and south of Krishna. The, these fertile areas were also surrounded by Nisam of Hyderabad to meet the expenses for the maintenance of the British troops. It was given in lay of cash payment by Nisam of Hyderabad. During the period of Lord Wellesley, the second Indian state entered into a subsidiary alliance was Auth. Auth signed the subsidiary alliance with Wellesley in 1801. And one of the main impact of this treaty signed between Wellesley and the Nabab of Auth was that he was required to surrender half of his kingdoms to the British. It included Rohilkant and the fertile regions between the river Ganga and the Yamuna, following which he disbanded his own army. Nizam, Nabab of Auth, disbanded his own army. And in addition to that, the British was free to station their army in any part of the Auth, not only in the state capital of Lucknow, but also in any other part of his dominion. Now, the third state on which Wellesley wanted to impose subsidiary alliance was Mysore. Now, Mysore was under the rule of Tipu Sultan. He had earlier been defeated through the Third Anglo-Mysore War and with whom the British signed the Treaty of Sirangapatam. Lord Wellesley wanted to completely wipe out Tipu or forced him to submission before the British. Lord Wellesley asked Tipu to accept subsidiary alliance, as in the case of other states of Nizam of Hyderabad and the Nabab of Auth. But Tipu was not ready to accept the subsidiary alliance proposed by Lord Wellesley. He replied that it was better to die like a soldier rather to leave a miserable dependent on the infidels, non-believers. This was the reply made by Tipu when Wellesley's agents approached Tipu Sultan for the imposition of the subsidiary alliance in Mysore. So, since Tipu refused to accept the imposition of the subsidiary alliance on Mysore, Wellesley made up his mind to end Tipu. Certain acquisitions were made against Tipu. 
what were the excuses lord wellesley discovered for attacking tipu the reasons behind the attack of tipu was that tipu was sending mission to arabia samansha of afghanistan constantinople or the french in mauritius as well as to the france these were the excuses discovered by lord wellesley to attack mysore leading to the last round of struggle between the british and mysore ruler it was the fourth anglo mysore war in 1799 military operations were started with the directions of lord wellesley against tipu sultan on 17 april 1799 even though tipu offered stiff resistance against the british he was defeated while heroically fighting against the british it was with the help of the nizam of hyderabad the british was able to defeat tipu sultan nizam of hyderabad offered support to the english for the suppression of tipu on 4 may 1799 sirangapatnam was fell into the hands of the british with this the third round of struggle between the mysore ruler and the british came to an end now the major challenge to the british in south india came to an end these territories of the mysore in ruler tipu was shared between nizam of hyderabad and the british the british got canara coimbatore wayanad on malabar coast dharmapuram and the sea coast of mysore malabar was rich in pepper and cardamom as well as one of the settlements of the french was also on the malabar coast it was mahi it was considered as a threat by lord wellesley and after dividing the territories of the mysorean ruler among the nizam of hyderabad and the british krishna raj third a boy of the former hindu odayar family was declared as the nominal ruler for the titular head of the hindu odayar family after which the main intention of the lord wellesley was realized it was none other than the imposition of subsidiary alliance on mysore state with this mysore passed into the hands of the british now subsidiary alliance on marathas like the case of mysore marathas were one of the growing power in western india he wanted to wellesley wanted to introduce the subsidiary alliance on marathas as well but one of the powerful maratha chief minister nana fatnavis he stubbornly opposed sub the plan of lord wellesley to impose subsidiary alliance on marathas nana fatnavis was well aware 
of the dangers posed by the British through the imposition of the subsidiary alliance. But the death of Nana Fatnavis gave an opportunity to Lord Wellesley to intervene in the affairs of the Marathas and to realize his aim of imposing subsidiary alliance. Certain internal dissensions among the Marathas provided this sought after opportunity to Lord Wellesley. First of all, let us look at what kind of internal dissensions which had developed leading to the intervention of the British in Maratha affairs. In 1800, the armies of the Maratha chief Jasundrao Kolkar. The Marathas got divided into four chiefs in addition to Peshwa at Pune. Jasundrao Kolkar, he was a powerful Maratha chief. He defeated the combined armies of another Maratha chiefs in India as well as the Peshwa at Pune. Peshwa's capital was located at Pune. Jasundrao Kolkar, after defeating the Sindhya ruler and Peshwa, the city of Pune was captured. In this background, Peshwa Vajrao II, he sought British help in this background. It provided a much sought after opportunity to Wellesley to impose subsidiary alliance. Peshwa Vajrao second subsidiary alliance and signed the Treaty of Basain in 1802. Under the Treaty of Basain, through which the British was able to impose the subsidiary alliance on one of the most powerful states in India, the Marathas of Western India. He agreed to permanently station British army at Pune, the capital of the Peshwa. In return, the Peshwa agreed to provide territories yielding 26 lakhs rupees per annum. These territories were to be surrendered in Gujarat, that is south of Tapti, fertile region, one of the fertile region was surrendered. And the regions between Tapti and Narmada, it was another fertile region, Peshwa agreed to surrender to the British for the upkeep of the military forces at his capital, Pune. Peshwa also surrendered the city of Suraj. And now Peshwa was also agreed to surrender all his claims in Nizam's territory. He also agreed that not to resort to arms against Gaik war. And he also agreed the intervention of the English East India Company in disputes between the Peshwa or the Nizam or the Gaik war. In all these differences, the English East India Company would make intervention. He also agreed not to employ Europeans of any nation at war with the British. It was to prevent the employment of the French in Peshwa's territory. Again, under the Treaty of Basain, Peshwa agreed not to enter with the treaty with any power 
without the consultation of the English East India Company. These were the terms of the Treaty of Basin signed between Peshwa and the British. The importance of treaty are going to be looked into. It made one of the most powerful states, the Marathas, dependent on the British. British paramount power was established at the capital of the Peshwa, Pune. Since Peshwa was the head of these Marathas, since Peshwa accepted the subsidiary alliance of the English East India Company, all other chiefs also became subordinate to the English East India Company as a natural corollary. He wants to surrender his foreign policy to the care of the English East India Company. But Peshwa was no longer in a position to maintain an independent foreign policy. It was to be controlled by the English East India Company. The company was made the main arbiter in all disputes between Peshwa and other Maratha chiefs during the period between 1782 and 1802 these Maratha chiefs used to engage in inter warfare with each other. In addition to that in all disputes between Peshwa and other Indian rulers the English East India Company would be the mediator. It, he also surrendered all his claims on Nizam's territory. Marathas used it to collect tax, which came in known as Chauth. It was one fourth of the total production. Now the Marathas were no longer in a position to collect the Chauth from the Nizam's territory after the Treaty of Basin. Second Anglo Maratha War. The Treaty of Basin was a national humiliation for the Marathas. So, Sindhya and Bonsle, they decided to challenge the British. But Golkar, he did not come forward against the British, he left, kept aloof from the scene. But in these wars, the British were able to defeat because of the military superiority of the British, they were able to defeat both Sindhya and Bonsale and concluded with them separate treaties. The Treaty of Diogao was concluded between the Raja of Bonsale and the British on 17 December 1803. Under this treaty, Raja of Bonsale surrendered Katak in Orissa and the entire territory west of the river Varda. Another treaty was concluded between the Raja of Sindhya with the British. The Treaty of Surji Arjun Khan, which was concluded between the British and the ruler of Sindhya on 30 December 1803. What were the effects of this treaty? Under this treaty, he had to surrender the territory between Yamuna and the Janjas, the territory north of Jaipur and Jodhpur. He was forced to surrender Ahmednagar Fort and harbour of Broch. And both of these defeated rulers accepted British residence at their capital. In 1804, Golkar ended 
another war with the British. In this war also, Golkar could not win over the British. He concluded another treaty with the British, the Treaty of Rajpur Kutch. This treaty was signed between the Raja of Golkar and the British on 25 December 1805. Under this treaty, the Golkar also lost territories. He lost territories north of river Chambal and Bundelkhand region. These territories were surrendered by Golkar to the British. From this, the second Anglo Maratha war not only, not only shattered completely the Marathas, but also they became virtually the dependence of the British. Now, during the period of Lord Wellesley, two powerful states, one Mysore in South India and another Marathas in Western India, were surrendered to the British. And in these two states, Marath, dominions of the Marathas, and in Mysore, Lord Wellesley was able to impose a subsidiary alliance. In what way subsidiary alliance helped this British? Now, see. The company was able to station their military at four important state capitals, Mysore in South India, Hyderabad in Dakan, Lucknow, the capital of the Auth in North India, and Pune in Western India. In these four important state capitals, the British was now able to station their armies. How did this help the British? From these four military focal points, the British army could move to any part of the India easily and could suppress the enemies. Now coming to the British expansion, within a short span of time, under Wellesley, the administration of the English East India Company extended to new dominions. From the Fourth Anglo-Mysore War, as we have seen that in the fourth round of struggle between the Mysorean ruler and the British, the British was able to defeat Tipu Sultan and his dominions were shared between the Nizam of Hyderabad who had helped the British in the military operations against Tipu. The British after defeating the Tipu Sultan got South Canada, Vainaj which was rich in cardamom and pepper, Coimbatore. Dharmapuram, besides Siranga Patanam, all these territories went into the hands of the English East India Company with the defeat of Tipu Sultan in 1799. From the Naisam, through the Treaty of 2nd October 1800, the company got Bellari and Kadappa. From the Nava of Auth, the company received Rohilkand region, Farukabad, Mainpuri, Etua, Kanpur, Fatehgarh, Alagabad, Asimgarh, Basti, and Gorakhpur. This half of the dominions of the Nava of Auth passed into the hands of the British. From the Second Anglo 
Maratha war. The British got Upper Dob, that is the region between the Ganges and the Yamuna. The territory is north of the Jaipur, Jodhpur, Gohat, the Broch, Ahamanagar, and Katak in Orissa. All these territories went into the hands of the British from the Marathas. In 1799, through the policy of subsidiary alliance, Tanjur passed into the hands of the English East India Company. Suraj in 1800 and Karnatik in 1801 passed into the hands of the British. With the policy of subsidiary alliance, no doubt Wellesley within a short span of time was able to make the English East India Company supreme power in India. From the period of Lord Wellesley, the defense of India became the responsibility of the English East India Company but because most of the dominions passed into the hands of the English East India Company. It was possible to create direct routes connecting Calcutta, Madras and Madras with Bombay. These territories passed into the hands of the English East India Company. With this policy of subsidiary alliance, Wellesley brought into the control of the English East India Company large parts of the country. Now, my other questions on this topic, what were the advantages and disadvantages of the subsidiary alliance? With regard to the Indian states as well as English East India Company, how did Wellesley expand the dominions of the English East India Company? Importance of the Treaty of Passain, importance of the Fourth Anglo Mysore War. Thank you, the students, for watching my class. Thank you. of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvellous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that 
for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.